I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Sono New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York's eclectic enclaves one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus Lebron. This month we're here in the bustling student lounge of CUNY's Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The shipyard and industrial complex spans 300 acres and is located in northwest Brooklyn on the East River. The coastline complex that once launched ships during World War II is now launching small businesses. It's in part because of that the Navy Yard is being touted as the shepherd of New York's next manufacturing economy. In 2013, the Pratt Center for Community Development lauded the city for purchasing the yard and transforming it from a declining shell into a thriving ecosystem. At the time, the industrial complex had an economic impact of $2 billion, that's billion with a B, on the local economy. These days, it's even more than that. The newly installed Navy Yard CEO, Lindsey Green, reiterated the yard's commitment to small businesses and diversity when she said she wants to, quote, cement the area as an inclusive economic hub. On this episode, business savvy. How the Navy Yard is investing big to bring small businesses to the neighborhood. The Can-Do Yard, the industrial complex and its significant role in American history. And the future of film, CUNY's effort to help Hollywood with its diversity push. Those stories and more coming up as we explore the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Building 77 in the Brooklyn Navy Yard has become the center of much of the growth and innovation in the complex. The 16-story building was once a windowless World War II relic, but after an extensive renovation, the building, with windows, is now home to a wide range of small businesses that do everything from food to film production. We go inside with Craig Thompson. So we're now actually in production today, so we're brewing our elixir. And this is like an 80-gallon kettle. Inside the kettle is Annie Basson's namesake brew, Annie's Ginger Elixir, a wellness beverage that's a mix of ginger, berry tea, and other healthy ingredients. Any kind of inflammatory issue you have in your body, it just is the most powerful, natural way of uh, healing inflammation. Annie moved from home brewing in her kitchen to this 1,000-square-foot space, which she moved into in 2018. The company has four employees on site, two full-time and two part-time, and three off-site. And we've scaled it up, you know, from a little pot like this to gallons and gallons every week. Annie's Ginger Elixir is just one of the more than 500 businesses that call the Brooklyn Navy Yard home. The Navy Yard Development Corporation says these businesses contribute $2.5 billion to the city's economy. Those figures have increased considerably since 2017 when the Navy Yard underwent significant expansion. More than just the city's economy, many of these businesses help the local economy by employing people from the neighborhood. But we get a lot of people in the neighborhood who come by and inquire, and we've been able to source a lot of our staff from here in Brooklyn, um, especially in the past year or so. Rebecca Zaus is Assistant Director of Operations for Russ and Daughters. Russ and Daughters is an iconic family business that's been located on Lower East Side since 1914. The company opened this counter and bakery in 2019 after Building 77 was renovated. But we're still serving the traditional smoked salmons, bagels, schmears, spreads that we've been making for generations now. Zhao says they chose to place their third location here because of the yard's history. And so the history of, of the Navy Yard, I think, really was that kind of main aim for us to kind of want to move into this space. It's all about maintaining the traditions of the past while we move into the future. And I think the Brooklyn Navy Yard is a really great example of that. And it really paralleled the same like ideals and goals that we had with Russ and Daughters. History, though, is not the only thing attracting new businesses to the Navy Yard. 
So many different businesses. The diversity of the art is, is really, really interesting. We meet so many people every week of, that do all sorts of interesting stuff. So to us, that's like super cool. Transmitter Brewing is a craft brewery on the ground floor, which opened in the newly renovated Building 77 in 2019. It's a small business with only four employees, including co-founder Rob Kolb. We were in Long Island City in about 1,800 square feet, 12-foot ceilings, little garage underneath the Pulaski Bridge, which we outgrew, I think, in the first six months. The thing about the Navy Yard is that if you're paying your rent, they don't really kick, kick tenants out. They're all about growing businesses, creating jobs. Like Annie Basson's company, back on the 10th floor. Oh, it's the most amazing um, community for us. Um, they really are very supportive of small businesses, so we uh, participate in the cohort um, that they offer and also uh, the interns who, Jesse back here, was our former intern and we brought her on staff. And with her elixir, now in 800 stores and counting, they might be moving again. So we already need probably double the space. For Diverse City, I'm Craig Thompson. The three NYCHA complexes adjacent to the Navy Yard have experienced New York's inequalities up close as the neighborhoods around it develop and gentrify. The yard has served as a kind of lifeline, providing jobs and resources to its low-income neighbors, making sure they're not left out of the emerging tech economy. Shannon Ayala has more. And they're actually building all around us. They're closing us in. Daryl Burgess is a tenant leader at the Ingersoll Houses. Ingersoll is one of three New York City Housing Authority communities adjacent to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. He says the frenzy development of Fort Greene, downtown Brooklyn, and Dumbo in the last couple of decades has really changed his community. It felt like we were alienated from our homes. Everything was taken away from us. Burgess says the initial influx of wealth to the area didn't exactly trickle down. He says things worsened when affordable places to shop dwindled and public housing residents missed out on job opportunities. There was a huge opportunity for our residents to benefit from working in construction but no one made it available for the residents to be a part of that. All that changed in 2014, when he began his tenure at the Resident Association. He says the Navy Yard has been a friend in that sea of isolation. I received uh, emails from the Brooklyn Navy Yard Employment Center daily on specific jobs. Also, there's a representative from the Brooklyn Navy Yard that comes to our Resident Association meetings every Monday, every last Monday of the month, to explain to the residents what the um, yard has to offer. The city-owned industrial park is overseen by the Brooklyn Navy Yard Economic Development Corporation. It's a nonprofit created by the city to keep local manufacturing jobs alive. We talked to David Ehrenberg less than two weeks before he stepped down as president and CEO of the Navy Yard. And so in the last eight years, we've really focused a lot of attention on how do we connect local residents to the opportunities that we're creating. Ehrenberg says the Navy Yard is not just an industrial park. It's also a public trust. So it has a mandate to keep local workers employed without needing a college degree, whether in traditional shops or high tech factories. Ehrenberg says when he started there in 2013, the Navy Yard provided 6,000 jobs. That number has grown to 12,000. And following a major recent expansion, it's expected to reach 20,000. He says many of these are local. What you see are concentric circles, that as you get closer and closer and closer to the yard, there's a higher and higher density of people who work here. He says in a typical year, except for during the pandemic, the employment center placed about 600 NYCHA residents into jobs. He says about a quarter of the jobs placed through the employment center go to NYCHA residents and formerly incarcerated people. So flipping the script, we're in the regular job market, those are barriers. Those are reasons sometimes people aren't given the job. We're putting those resumes on the top of the pile and giving them the best chance possible to get the job. 
In 2019, the Navy Yard organization also made room for Wegmans, the popular supermarket ranked by Fortune magazine as one of the best employers. They have brought, I think it's five to 600 quality jobs to the local community and continue to partner with us and the local community to make sure that those jobs are going to local residents. Ehrenberg says that community ethos is part of the Navy Yard as a whole. He says factory workers stepped up during the pandemic, converting factories to make emergency supplies like face shields, masks, and sanitizer. It was really an extraordinary thing to watch. Um, kind of still makes me a little emotional when I think about it. The manufacturing sector can still be a source for jobs moving into the tech era, Ehrenberg says, as long as it's manufacturing that evolves with the times. Um, and particularly since we're a nonprofit landlord, we can say, you know what, we're not just going to bring in the pure tech companies. We're going to bring in the tech manufacturing companies, the tech enabled manufacturing companies and bring them here, give them rents that they can afford and let them create that wider diversity of jobs that we're after. Burgess says he learned early on that not everyone in his community was aware of the opportunities at the Navy Yard and that the success of local hiring has been a community effort. If you sit back and you don't get involved, you won't find out what's going on. But those residents who are active, they know. Shannon Ayala for Diverse City. The Navy Yard's heyday was back during World War II, when it had one of the largest, most diverse and skilled labor forces in the country. Vanessa Monet takes us back in time. So the Brooklyn Navy Yard was established in 1801 um, as one of the original six shipyards of the U.S. Navy. And throughout its naval history, its primary mission was actually the repair, outfitting, and modernization of U.S. Navy ships. Andrew Gustafson is the vice president of Turnstile Tours, a company branded as a social enterprise that works with nonprofits and community organizations to help them welcome the public. The company has a variety of types of tours throughout New York City. Three of them are based in the Brooklyn Navy Yard alone. One popular tour focuses on the Navy Yard's significance during World War II. It was the most transformative period in the Yard's history. The sheer volume of work that we did here during World War II was absolutely enormous, and it's how the Brooklyn Navy Yard gained its nickname during World War II as the Can-Do Yard. Uh, there are many cases in which the Navy Yard was sent um, what were thought to maybe be lost causes, ships that were so severely damaged. Um, but because the Brooklyn Navy Yard had one of the longest tenured and most skilled workforces um, in the country at any shipyard, um, those jobs were sent here. Um, and in many cases, those ships were repaired uh, and, and put back into service. A couple of those ships that were built a generation apart have an even greater historical significance. They were bookends to the U.S.'s involvement in World War II. In 1916, we built the USS Arizona, uh, which of course was sunk at Pearl Harbor, killing 1,177 sailors aboard. Uh, that, of course, brought the United States into World War II. Uh, and during the height of the war, we constructed the USS Missouri. Um, the largest battleship ever built by the United States and the last battleship built by the United States. Uh, and of course, that ship was given the honor on September 2nd, 1945, of being the site of the signing of the instrument of surrender in Tokyo Bay, bringing World War II to a close. The Navy Yard didn't just aid in fighting the Axis powers, it also helped everyday New Yorkers in climbing the economic ladder. There were new opportunities for African Americans and other minorities to work at the Navy Yard. That workforce of over 70,000 people was larger and more diverse than any other this country had seen. So for example, uh, we expanded uh, opportunities for women. For the first time, women came to work here uh, as production workers, actually building ships. Um, we had about 10,000 women uh, that worked um, in a variety of different roles here um, during World War II. After World War II, the Navy Yard continued to operate up until 1966. Around that time, the federal government closed about 95 military bases, which included the elimination of the Yard's remaining 10,000-person workforce. 
Eventually, the space was transferred to the city of New York. The impact of the closure of the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, was absolutely enormous. Um, the workforce stood at about 9,600 people uh, when they announced the closure uh, in 1964. Um, but this was part of an overall deindustrialization of New York City. So there were many large firms, especially in this area, um, Williamsburg, Fort Greene, Clinton Hill, uh, a lot of industrial businesses here uh, were closing at that time as well. So it had a big impact uh, on the local community for sure. Uh, and so that is why um, from the outset, the, the hope uh, was that the city could restart this economic engine and, and bring opportunities uh, back into the Brooklyn Navy Yard and focus those opportunities uh, on people who were living in the local community. The city reopened the site as an industrial park in 1969 and in 1981 installed the Brooklyn Development Corporation to run the yard. However, it became clear over time that many infrastructure upgrades were necessary and the tenant base would need to be diversified. Major investments over the past few decades, coupled with the 2018 announcement of a $2.5 billion phased expansion, is returning the yard to something akin to its World War II glory days. For Diverse City, I'm Vanessa Monet. The Navy Yard is home to the Hispanic Information Telecommunications Network, or HITN. HITN is the largest Spanish-speaking public television station in the United States. The station's been around for more than 40 years, and as I found out, it's had to make sacrifices to survive. Nature shows such as Mundo Salvaje, or Savage Planet, are among some of HITN's most popular. These non-original programs are a major part of how the network has been trying to help its bottom line. We bring in stuff from Discovery and Nat Geo, which our viewing audience has never seen. So if it was filmed four years ago, it's still new to our eyes, right? So for us, that's the advantage. And it reduced our cost in production, which helped give us more sustainability, which also helped us to grow here. The station was founded in 1981. That's when the former school principal, Jose Luis Rodriguez, petitioned the FCC to create a public television station to service the city's growing Hispanic population. The concept was to unite education and entertainment. Usually they looked at separately. We try to put it together. We try to make it fun for the family to view things together. Making that happen has gotten more expensive. So when CEO Mike Nieves took over four years ago, he had to make a few changes. Back then, the station was known for producing more original content that covered local and national issues. But now, the cable station that reaches 44 million households across the continental United States and in Puerto Rico only produces one show locally. It's a Sunday morning talk show called Studio DC. That cable audience is what pays for much of the station's estimated $16 million budget. The rest of their funding comes from city and state investment, as well as grants. The network had to make cuts to keep production costs low at a time when the local and state governments were tightening their belts. Nieves hopes that the station can return to previous levels of production with the expansion of a rooftop studio that will nearly double their space. In the meantime, they are renting out their facilities to the likes of ESPN to generate revenue. We have to be sure that we keep year after year being sustainable, right? And if, we, if we're not proactive, what then happens is then you, you find yourself in a crisis. Cutting shows was just one of the format changes with which the all-Spanish station has experimented over the years. At one point, we had a block that was required in our agreement with Spectrum of an hour and a half block that was in English. It didn't really, it didn't really take on because they view us as a Spanish language channel. HITN has continued to find ways of reaching its maturing audience. At a time when many viewers are cutting the cable cord, the company launched an app to stream its programming and a separate one for children's shows. 
The network also recently created a competition for teens interested in video production to submit their work. Cientos de independent filmmakers te traen su talento y visión. Nieves is hopeful about HITN's future and is looking forward to celebrating the station's more than 40 years of work in the community. Plans for a 40-year celebration had to be scuttled because of the pandemic. We're actually going to now gear ourselves, we're that confident, to celebrate the 45th, right? So we're already having meetings to, in discussion on how to, to do that. Because we want to have an event. We want to have an event where we want to bring New Yorkers here. We want to bring school children here. We want to have you know, a whole bunch of events that allows us to show the people our gratitude for their, for their city's support. We're still here in the student lounge at CUNY's Fierstein Graduate School of Cinema, but now it's a lot quieter because the students have gone back to class. The school is positioning itself to produce more filmmakers of color at a time when Hollywood is shining a searchlight for more diverse stories. We spoke to the school's executive director, the two-time Academy Award nominee Richard Gladstein, and a student, Aliyah Bino, about what makes the school a marquee destination. I think there's a lot of things that make our school somewhat distinct from other film schools. Um, our curriculum is somewhat similar, it's very hands-on. Um, what's slightly different about um, our school is the community that we serve, we're extraordinarily diverse. Uh, more than half the students are people of color. And we're part of CUNY and part of Brooklyn College, so our tuition is literally a third of other film schools. I think the most exceptional thing about Fierstein are the students. Everyone here, where we come from, a lot of us are international students. A lot of people commute from far distances, and once we get in this building, you're kind of looking at the future of the film industry. Our school is situated on the lot of Steiner Studios, which is one of the biggest lots and places for making movies um, in the world, really, and certainly the biggest in New York. I think it's a really big benefit to have school here at Steiner Studios. Uh, we kind of get this type of experience that not a lot of other film schools and students get to have. I mean, who gets to say every day, oh yeah, I go to a film lot for my education every single day, and it's just a normal part of your routine, and we kind of get used to it, but it's definitely something we never take for granted. Started off trying to figure out what film school I wanted to go to, of course, all the schools in California, a couple in Texas, couldn't really afford it, and when I found out about Fierstein, it became the only school I wanted to go to, it wasn't just my first choice, it was the only choice. We have a variety of ways that we bring the industry to Fierstein and bring Fierstein to the industry. So each of the individual instructors frequently bring industry members to the class. What I try to do is to bring um, industry members to the school in general and do seminars for everyone. We brought all the filmmakers behind Queen's Gambit, the writer, director, producer, like cinematographer, that, well, editor, right. composer and they gave a seminar and we watched some episodes of that show just as it was coming out. Um, we had Gus Van Zandt, who's a wonderful filmmaker, come and speak with all the students. It wasn't until after Good Will Hunting that that same idea, when pitched to Casey Silver, who thought I was crazy, all of a sudden that idea had merit. You know, they thought it was a great idea because Good Will Hunting was making money. So, they thought, man, Sant can make money, let him do Psycho, and then it didn't make money. But if it wasn't successful, it would have gotten the studios busy remaking frame by frame other movies, which might have been a nightmare. Reggie Hudlin's a wonderful producer, writer, and director, and he came. Learn about Cuban uh, movies in the, in the 60s and 70s. Learn about, you know, Fellini. Learn about everything, right? And still, without shame, 
And eventually, as you are telling stories that mean something to you, you will see styles and techniques from other filmmakers, and you will adapt them to your own purpose, right? That was the first seminar that I attended. I remember I left out of work early just so I could see it. Uh, I grew up watching quite a few things that he did, but most recently with the DC comics um, and like the static shock uh, era that's going on, he kind of talked about it a little bit, and I'm a huge comic book fan. I definitely want to take a lot of comic books and just short stories and adapt them into full movies. So I really got to benefit by seeing him here on campus. It's about bringing these filmmakers, music makers, media makers, to just talk about their art and their craft and demystify it for everyone. This is attainable. They're just like you. They're just a few years ahead. And this is where you want to go. So might as well ask them some questions and find out how they got there. That's our look at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Join us next month when we'll head over to Ozone Park in Queens. Till then, thanks for joining us as we explore our diverse city.